when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to faith, and when it comes to the church, when it comes to the body of Christ, we have to take the limits off of these things. We place limits on it, and it stops us. When we have these limits, it stops us from uh, walking in the fullness and walking in the wholeness of what God has for us. Somebody say, remove the limits. It is vital over the next three weeks that you are here, that you are locked in, and that you are ready. I wholeheartedly believe that by removing the limits, by changing your perception, by changing the way that you think, changing your mindset, changing your hearts towards these three things, your very life can change in a way that you've never even thought. Changing the way that you see Jesus, changing the way that you see faith, and changing the way that you see the church. Now, if this is your first time here, you're going to hear some people shouting at me. That's what we do here, okay? <laughs> if you fill in, you want to shout, you join right on in, Okay. You're going to hear some amens. You're going to hear some preach nephews. You're going to hear a whole bunch of stuff, okay? That's fine. Today, I want to start with us taking the limits off of the way that we see Jesus. I believe that if we want to see the full manifestation of Jesus' finished work in our life, then the limit that we have placed on Jesus is something that we have to remove. There are some misconceptions, there are some ideals that we have to challenge. Now, if you're here today and maybe you got drug here or, 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 or you just, you know, saw something in the mail and you figure you stopped by and you have yet to uh, give your life, surrender your life to Christ, you have not made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, or maybe you're on the fence. Maybe like, I don't know, I just came to, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I can guarantee you that there are some probably, there's probably some limits there's probably some preconceived notions that have altered your perception about Jesus. And today, I also want to challenge you to consider removing them. Are you ready? Let's dive in. Okay, first, if we're going to take the limits off of the way that we see Jesus, then the first thing that we have to do is understand the purpose of why he came. We have to understand the purpose of why he came. There's this perception of the world that God is this angry being, that he's angry. He sits up at this high place that we can't get to, and he watches us and waits for us to do something wrong so he can cause something bad to happen to us. But if we pray, you know, if we go to church and we do everything right, then when we get to heaven, we can get in. This is not true. And I believe by having a misconception about God, then obviously we have a misconception about Jesus. I really need you, believers, pre-believers, to really get to know the God that we serve. This God of the Bible is a God that loves you immensely. A God that is passionately in love with you. He is not mad at you. He is not in a bad attitude as far as you are concerned. God wants to be in relationship with you. He is not sitting waiting for you to mess up so, so he can cause something to happen to you. God doesn't, he's not loving you more because you gave at church or you let somebody over on the highway. In the same way, he's not loving you less because you've messed up, because you've made some bad decisions. Hear me and hear me well. God's love is not conditional. God's love is not conditional. Once you accept and you receive God's love, there is nothing that you can do that will separate you from it. There is nothing that you can do that can separate you from the love of God. I like to go in the Bible here because I believe y'all don't believe me. So Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Romans chapter 8, verse 35, it says, Who could ever divorce us from the endless love of God's anointed one? Absolutely no one, for nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love towards us. Troubles, pressures, and problems are unable to come between us in heaven's love. 
What about persecution, deprivation, dangers, threats? No, for they are all impotent to hinder omnipotent love. Verse 37 says, yet in the midst of all of these things, we triumph over them all. For God has made us to be more than conquerors. And his demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. Verse 38 says, so now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. Okay? He says, I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, over life's troubles, over fallen angels, or, or dark rulers in the heavens. Listen to this. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. See, you, you thought because you messed up that God didn't love you no more. You thought because you missed a couple Sundays or years of Sundays that, <laughs> that he didn't love you no more. You thought because you, you ain't prayed in a while that his love diminished for you. You thought that maybe because you forgot about him that he forgot about you and that his love has diminished from you, but his love has remained the same. Why? Because his love ain't got nothing to do with you. His love has nothing to do with you. Uh, 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 his love isn't based on you. It isn't based off of what you do or based off of what you did. His love is based on what Jesus, God's son, did over on the cross for you over 2,000 years ago. This is what Paul is talking about in verse 37. He says, and his demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. Then the question is, well, what is his demonstrated love? What, what is, what is, you know, Pastor, I'm new. I, I, don't, I, don't, I barely know what's going on. What, what, is his, what is his demonstrated love? John 3, 16 says, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten son so that whoever believes in, whoever trusts in, whoever clings to, whoever relies on him shall not perish or come to destruction or be lost, but have eternal everlasting life. Verse 17 says, for God did not send the son into the world in order to judge, to reject, to, reject, to condemn, to pass sentence on the world, but that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through him. That's his demonstrated love. He sent his son to die. Now, home team, okay, uh, followers of Jesus, Christians, we have to decide whether we believe this or not. See, you can say that you believe it. You can be excited about it. You can amen and shout me down, but we have to determine within ourselves, do we believe God's love? Are we trusting in are we clinging to? Are we relying on Jesus in every area of our life? Do we believe that we won't come to destruction? Do we believe that we won't be lost? Do we believe? Do we believe? And you can say what you want, but guess what? Your actions will show every single time. Your actions will show every single time when life's not going well, when people got attitude with you, when your boss acting crazy, when your bank account acting crazy, hallelujah, <laughs> when your kids acting crazy, when your spouse acting crazy, do you believe God's love for you? That's a hard thing. You have to determine that for yourself. Do you really believe? Do you really believe? If we aren't trusting, if we aren't clinging to, if we aren't relying God in the, these areas of our life, we have placed a limit on what God is able to do in that area of our life. We must believe, and believing starts with understanding the purpose of why he came. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. 
For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came to demonstrate God's love for us. We got to understand why he came. He came to demonstrate God's love for us. He did it in the healings. He did it when he fed the 5,000. He did it to the woman at the well. He did it to Zacchaeus, the woman with the issue of blood, the woman caught in adultery. Jesus didn't come to condemn us. He came to restore our relationship with God through his death, burial, and resurrection. And for us to show that love, that demonstrated love, that same love to others. Jesus came to demonstrate God's love for us. And Jesus came for people. He came for people like you and me. He came for broken, messed up, imperfect people. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. We have this thing twisted. Jesus isn't this estranged parent that we just run to when we're in deep trouble. You know, you got the parent that you have fun with, and then when you really messed up, you know, this this one that you go to, Dad, we need to talk. Uh, I think I'm, I really messed up on this. Jesus isn't this, this estranged parent that we run to when we're in deep trouble. Jesus wants to be in relationship with us. He wants to be in relationship with us. Jesus saw you. And I, over 2,000 years ago, and chose to suffer the pain, the humiliation, and the agony of the cross so that our relationship with God could be restored. And so that we wouldn't have to pay the penalty of death because of sin. Jesus came that we might have life and life more abundantly. We have to understand the purpose of why he came. If we're going to take the limits off the way that we see Jesus, then we have to be consciously aware of that. When we realize that he came to demonstrate God's love, when we realize that he came to restore the relationship with God, when we realize he came up for, for messed up people like you and me, no matter where they were born, no matter what their skin color or their political affiliation is, when we realize that, when we grasp that, it changes your view of who Jesus is. And when that view is changed, it should change your view of who you are. He is the son of God. You are his son. You are his daughter. You are his prized possession. See, 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 I, I, I move a little different. I move a little different when, I, when, when you know who you are. You, you move, uh, see, see you ain't, you ain't, you ain't going to catch me with my head down. You're not going to catch me, oh, woe is me, and I just feel so defeated, and life is, no, uh-uh, 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 I'm victorious, let me tell you. I, 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 I don't care, I don't, I don't care what's going on, why? Because the Son of God, let me go on this side, because the Son of God has my back. Because all of heaven has my back. I don't know about y'all, but God don't play about me. He don't play about me. So when I move, I move differently because I know all of... Christina, please let these people know. All of heaven has my back. What, I, what am I afraid of? Here's the thing. The only reason I would be afraid is if I don't trust his love for me. If I feel like he's going to fail me, if I feel like he's not going to come through, I don't know why we feel like that. He done came through every single time before. But, you know, we, we flesh and blood. But when I understand whose I am, I move differently. And I don't care what's going on. I don't care what the news say. They can talk about milk, eggs, gas. I'm not concerned. Why? Because all of heaven has my back. Because I understand, because I understand God's love for me. I got it. Pastor Ryan said I got to leave on time, okay? So let me, let me hurry up. If we're going to take the limits off of the way that we see Jesus, 
the first thing that we have to do is understand the purpose of why he came. The second thing that we have to do is separate the misrepresentations of Jesus from the truth of who he really is. Separate the misrepresentations from G- of Jesus from the truth of who he really is. One of the main reasons that people leave the faith, it isn't because they didn't get an answer prayer. It isn't because they had a discrepancy with the Bible. One of the main reasons that people fall away from the faith is because of their interactions with other people who came to be representatives of Jesus. It's not because of, oh, I didn't like the music. It's, it's, it's not because, oh, you know, it's a little too loud. That's not why they leave in Jesus. They leave in Jesus because of us. People who claim to be representatives of Jesus, not representing Jesus correctly. And so if we're going to take the limits off of the way that we see Jesus, then we have to separate these misrepresentations from who Jesus really is. We've all been at a point uh, uh, in our faith where, where hopefully we wasn't the one, but we run into people, right? who say that they love Jesus, but as you, who say that they're believers, that they're Christians, but as you, you, you dig a little deeper, you see that their, their morals, their, their values, their character, their, 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 their love walk and their actions don't line up with the person. I thought you loved Jesus. Then why are you so mean? I just want to know why you so, if, if he done so much for you, why are you angry all the time? <laughs> but, you, but you claim to love him, right? But you claim to love him. We have to separate those things. Mahatma Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Oh. Got to separate those things. Here is, it, this is why this is important. This isn't a new thing. And if you have yet to accept Christ, you're a pre-believer, that's what I call him. And the reason that you're on the fence is because you've had a bad interaction with Christians. Guess what? You are not alone. You are not alone. If you don't understand how someone who claims to love Jesus could do dot, 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 or how they could say dot, 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 I want to first apologize. I want to apologize because that has happened or that is happening. But please know that Jesus dealt with the same thing when he was here on this earth. That's why we got to separate these misrepresentations from who Jesus really is. We have to separate it. Luke chapter 18, verse 15. Jesus is handling this. He says, one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But when the disciples saw this. When the ones who've been around him all the time, the one who's seen him healing, who know Jesus, when they saw this, they scolded the parents for bothering him. Then Jesus called the children and said to the disciples, let the children come to me. Do not stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I'll tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. So even the disciples had it messed up. Let's keep going. Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to start at verse 6. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with this alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. And the disciples were indignant when they saw this. And they said, what a waste. These disciples, let me tell y'all something. (laughs) These boys got to get it together. Verse 9, they said, what a waste. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, replied, why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Y'all pray for the disciples. Luke chapter 22. 
Luke chapter 22, verse 47. But even as Jesus said this, a crowd approached led by Judas, one of the 12 disciples. Judas walked over to Jesus to greet him with a kiss. But Jesus said to Judas, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? When the other disciples saw what was about to happen, they exclaimed, Lord, should we fight? We brought them things with us, Jesus. We, we got the sword, Jesus. We, what's, what's popping? Let's go. And one of them, because it's always one that don't want to wait for the go. And one of them struck at the high priest slave, slashing off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Listen to me. If you are here today and you are on the fence about committing your life to Jesus because of people, then you are not alone. Jesus dealt with it right here many times in the Bible. As a matter of fact, 80% of the New Testament is written to correct problems with people. Paul is writing these letters because people is messing up. You're not alone. This is something that even the disciples dealt with, that Jesus dealt with, that we deal with even to this day. But we have to be careful to separate the misrepresentations of Jesus from the truth of who Jesus really is. We see in these instances, Jesus had to personally handle these things. And he used them as an opportunity to show the true character of who he really was and ultimately who we really should be. He did that so that we could read, so that we could see, so that seed would be implanted and that we would understand how we're supposed to live as well. So people don't keep running into these misrepresentations. As believers, we are supposed to strive to be like Christ. But because we're flesh and blood, sometimes we miss the mark. But if you're making a character decision about who Jesus is, then it has to be backed up by who he really is, not by people, but by the accounts that we see found in his word. We see Jesus healing the man in the pool of Bethesda in the in the height of social consequence. He knew it was the Sabbath. He knew it was going to be a problem, but he cared about people more. He cared about people more in John chapter 5. In John 13, we see Jesus washing the disciples' feet, even though he was the son of God. Let me tell you about washing feet, because um, I don't really like feet like that. So we're going to have a feet washing. And just let me tell you, whenever that Lord should, should move upon us, have, just know it's a sacrifice, okay? <laughs> but we see Jesus, the son of the living God, washing the disciples' feet. So when we see people acting like they're too big to move a chair, or when we see people acting like they're too big to help somebody. Oh, I got to go. I got to go. All right. All um, right. In John chapter 4, we see Jesus going out of his way to help a people, a nation that nobody cared for. Luke 23, we see Jesus walking in forgiveness to the very people who placed him on the cross while he was on the cross. He didn't wait to get off to say, Lord, forgive. I personally, never mind. He didn't wait till he got off. He hung there and said, Lord, forgive. Forgive them. So if we're making a character assessment about Jesus, then we got to look at the receipts. We got to look at the receipts. Although as believers, we are representatives of Jesus, people are not Jesus. And when your view of Jesus is only made up through people and not his word or your personal relationship, then your view now has a limit on it. And oftentimes, it's incomplete. That, that, that view was incomplete because the fullness of Jesus' character and ultimately the character of God can only be found in his word and in a personal relationship with him. If we're going to take the limits off of the way that we see Jesus, 
we have to separate those actions from the character of Jesus. This only happens in relationship because only in relationship can you know the true heart of God for yourself. Not from this pulpit, not from what I'm saying for yourself. And at that point, you will be able to take those limits off Jesus and remove him out of the box that you might have placed him in because of people's misrepresentation of who he is. He loves you. He wants to be intimately a part of your life. He don't only just want to see you and talk to you on Sunday. Some, I remember I used to say, you know, oh, that's too deep. That's too, no, he don't need, no, every area. Lord, what is it that you, what you think I should wear today, Jesus? You bless me with these clothes. What you think I should wear? God, what were you laughing, but it's, it's, it's for real. God, what would you have me do today? I know I got a schedule, God, but what would you have me do? I know I was supposed to go here, God. Is there anything that you, I mean, you did wake me up. You did put the breath of life in my lungs. Personal relationship. God, this, let me tell you about this coworker, Jesus, because you made him, but let me tell you, because... Let me tell you about my boss, God, I will intimately, because then you get to know the character of God. Then you get to know the heart of God. And there's no misconception that anybody can tell you because you know him for yourself. All right. We're going to take the limits off of the way that we see Jesus. First, we understand the purpose of why he came. Second, We separate the misrepresentations of Jesus from the truth of who he really is. And last thing, worship team, you can come remove the doubts. Matthew chapter 21, verse 18. Now, early in the morning, as Jesus was coming back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree at the roadside, he went to it and found nothing but leaves on it. He said, never again will fruit come from you. And at once the fig tree withered. When the disciples saw it, they were astonished and asked, how is it that the fig tree withered all the way at once? Jesus replied and said, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, if you have faith, personal trust and confidence in me, and you don't doubt or allow yourself to be drawn in two different directions, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but even if you say to the mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen if God will it. And whatever you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. See, Jesus is showing us here the effects of faith in our life. He's showing us that our confident, consistent faith combined with God's power can produce absolutely amazing results if the request is in harmony with God's purpose in our life and we do not doubt. Doubt and unbelief limit God's ability to move in and through our lives. And it limits our ability to rest confidently in the fullness of who Jesus is. Doubt limits our ability. When you don't know if that chair going to hold you up, you ain't, you ain't going to sit in it so secure. You going to shake that thing and press down on it. Why? You're like, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, why? There's doubt there as to what's going to happen. Doubt limits our ability for Jesus to, to, to really move in and through our lives. Matthew chapter 13 says, when Jesus, verse 54 says, when Jesus arrived, he began teaching. Everyone was dazed. They were astonishment over the depth of the revelation. They said, where did this man get this wisdom and miraculous power? Isn't he just the craftsman's son? Isn't his mother named Mary? And they go down his lineage, his brothers, Jacob, jo- Joseph, Simon, Jude. Isn't his sisters, you know, his brothers, mothers, sisters. Where did he get all this revelation and power? And the people became offended and began to turn against him. Jesus said, there's only one place a prophet isn't honored, his hometown. Verse 58 says, and their unbelief kept him from doing mighty miracles in Nazareth. Matthew chapter 14, the the disciples are on the boat and, you know, they got a little storm going on and 
At about 4 o'clock, verse 25 says, Jesus came walking on the waves. When the disciples saw him on top of the water, they were terrified and screamed that it was a ghost. Then Jesus said, be brave and do not be afraid, for I am here. Peter shouted, Lord, if it's you, then have me join you on the water. Jesus said, come and join me. So Peter stepped out on the water and began to walk towards Jesus. But when he took his eyes off Jesus, when he realized how high the waves were, he became frightened and started to sink. Save me, Lord, he cried. Jesus immediately stretched out his hand and lifted him up and said, what little faith you have. Why did you let doubt win? Doubt short circuits your faith and hinders your ability to trust in God. Doubt short circuits your faith and hinders your ability to trust in God. So what do we do? What do, what do we do when we have that feeling of doubt rising up? We remind ourselves of the love and the character of Jesus by giving less attention to our fears and doubts and giving more attention to the Word of God and the consistency of who God is. What happens when we do that? As we focus more on the character of Jesus, as we begin to pour over the scriptures, as we begin to remind ourselves of the goodness of God and how much he's done, something just, something just starts to stirring up on the inside of you. When you, ain't, when you ain't paying attention to the problem and you begin to pay attention to the faithfulness of God, something begins to stir up on the inside of you. Your trust in Jesus begins to strengthen. Your limits begin to fade away. Your doubts and your fears are no more. Remove the doubts. Now the world's going to tell you you have every reason to doubt because the world is shaky. God ain't never been shaky. Not one day. He has been consistent from the beginning of time, but the world will tell you, the news will tell you, social media will tell you, all of these things will tell you, oh, no, everything is shaking. No, 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 no. You don't need to doubt God because God has always been consistent. So in order to take the limits off of Jesus, we have to remove the doubt. Understand the purpose of why he came. Separate those inaccurate representations from the truth of who he really is and remove the doubt. For me, whenever I'm in that place of doubt, because I get there, let me tell you something, getting in this building, hallelujah, I've had opportunities where I wasn't sure how we were going to get this done. I wasn't sure if it was going to happen. For those of you who've been here, you know our story about the mall and how that whole thing turned around. And, and, and there was a moment that I was sitting in my studio, excuse me, I was sitting in my office. And I am crying. And I begin to call my wife. And I'm crying because I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know how. I'm tired. I'm at this place. I've done everything that I know to do. And I'm just not sure. That's why the scripture says, in your weakness is when my strength is made perfect. And that's why it matters your circle. It matters your spouse. It matters your friends. Because I call my wife and I say, baby, I, I just don't know. I, I don't know how this is going to happen. I'm overwhelmed. My, 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 my shoulders are heavy. And she began to pray over me, but she began to recite the word of God. She began to remind me that God will never leave you nor forsake you. She began to remind me that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. She began to remind me that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. She began to remind me that his love for me will never fail. And what happens? My doubts begin to go away. My faith begins to get stirred. And one year later, we sitting in this building right now. Hallelujah. 
of God. We are reminded of the character of God. You say, oh, oh, I, I'm, if you get, you, you, you got some friends, you got some people that say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just believing God for a miracle. Just take them right down Main Street. Tell them, tell them, make this right on Walnut, right? Come right up in this parking lot. You say, you see this right here? This is a miracle. This is a miracle. And so if you doubt whether God is still in the miracle working business, we got a building. Once, once, once you get to downtown, will it just look up and look to the right? You see that cross right there? You can be reminded every single time of who God is. You can be reminded of who God's people are. And you can begin to place yourself in a position to remove the doubts that you have. Remove the doubts that you have. Take the limits off of the way that you see Jesus. He wants to be intimately a part of every area of your life. And when you, when you understand, when you begin to comprehend his love for you, it changes everything. It changes everything. 